um, we've had like 20,000 years at least of some form of human civilization. And even after all those years, we still basically power ourselves by burning shit. You know, you have to like set something on fire basically in order to make anything happen. That sort of sucks, right? It's, I mean, it's, it's sort of weirdly embarrassing. Like, we're not like, you know, walking around in hyena skins or something. So why are we like setting stuff on fire in order to make things happen, right? I mean, there must be better way. So, so, you know, basically the way to, you know, what we're talking about doing then partly then also with, with any sort of Green New Deal plan is like, Okay, let's do a big massive redirect, right? Let's get the stop this all that stuff from flowing to the burn shit sectors of the economy <laughs> and flow it in other ways. <laughs> this is the MMT podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. For as little as a dollar a month, you can get early access to all our episodes and patron-only episodes. A big thank you to all our supporters so far. At the beginning there, you heard our guest this week, Professor of Law Robert Hockett. And following on from last week's episode... In a moment, we're going to be continuing our conversation with him about his work on digitizing the dollar and financing the Green New Deal. If you haven't already, do listen to our last episode to get the full context of this episode. And if you're new to MMT, you might want to check out our first three episodes, which I've linked to in the show notes, where me and Patricia talk through MMT basics in an accessible way. We think it's important to understand money as a system with a design and a purpose because even though people get that money is an artificial construct, that can then often lead them to waving it away as unimportant. Maybe because we don't like the feeling that we might be participating in a mass delusion or maybe we think that money is something only corrupt or greedy people should be obsessed with. But when you understand that your government doesn't get money from anywhere to finance itself, that new money comes into being every time a currency issuing government spends, and that monetarily sovereign governments can never run out of their own currency, you start to see that the money system plays an intentionally key role in governance. And that role can be positive or negative. And that largely depends on whether or not we have an informed electorate being presented with their real options based on how things actually work. Senator Mark Hanna is credited with once saying, there are two things that are important in politics. The first is money, and I can't remember what the second one is. Of course, as a Republican politician who inherited a lot of wealth and bought his way out of military service, speaking in the 1800s, how could he possibly know he was wittily writing the manual for elections in the 21st century? But if the last four years have taught us anything, it's that wealthy right-wing politicians who buy themselves out of military service need to be quarantined rather than laughed at. As we record this episode just before the 2020 US presidential election, I'd just like to say to any future historians who found this recording on a hard drive dug out of the rubble after the food riots, we want you to know that me and Patricia, all of our guests and other grassroots media projects like Macro and Cheese, Activist MMT, Money on the Left, Pocket Change and the Australian Unemployed Workers Fight Back podcast We did our best to show that there was an alternative to the toxic, outdated economic myths spread by comfortable, well-fed columnists and bought politicians who gave us false choices between this made-up thing called an economy and actual breathable air, or between numbers on a spreadsheet and actual human lives. In the words of Kurt Vonnegut, we could have saved the earth, but we were just too damn cheap. If you're listening to this Before the rubble, consider how rich in resources and ingenuity our nations are, and then consider the silliness of being a cheapskate when you've got unlimited money. And consider that the future's not set, and maybe we can choose to make the next election more than a choice between fascism and shoot-them-in-the-legs liberalism. Anyway, a few notes before we dive in. 
In this interview, you'll hear Robert talk about the Greenspan put, which is basically when the chair of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan, implicitly signaled to the finance sector that he would have the Fed intervene and buy bonds and other financial assets at above market prices if the stock market ever fell below a certain level, which led to what Greenspan would later call an irrational exuberance among investors which was in reality the very rational exuberance of a gambling addict with infinite credit who'd just been told they literally can't lose no matter which horse they put money on. Greenspan could make this implicit promise and investors could literally take it to the bank because financial insiders know that the US government can't run out of dollars any more than you or I can run out of emails. You'll also hear Robert talk about the work of Pavlina Cherniva and Fidel Kaboob, and I've linked to all our episodes with these two brilliant guests in the show notes, where I've also linked to some great articles and papers by Robert, and to where you can get your hands on his two most recent books. And, as ever, there's a link to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash mmtpodcast. Support starts at a dollar a month, which is 77 British pence at the time of recording, and no matter what level of support you give, you get early access to all our episodes and patron-only episodes where you can ask me and Patricia MMT questions. Your financial support really helps keep the show going and it keeps us going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and thinking and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too. So thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive in. Here's a question um, from one of our uh, patrons, actually, that uh, we have these question and answer sessions and uh, uh, look kind of monthly. And um, uh, this patron called Ganesh, it's kind of parallel to what you were saying, Bob. Uh, The question goes like this. MMT experts say that a currency issuer is free to spend with inflation being its only constraint. Or, or real resources. Uh, so in MMT, inflation should indicate when the economy is running out of real resources. Um, however, the current measures of inflation aren't that great. You know, for, there's mm-hmm. loads of different ones, but they're, they're not really set up to, uh, uh, mm-hmm. to spot it coming <laughs> almost. So if we really want to understand if the economy is truly running out of resources using inflation as a barometer, don't we need to first come up with an MMT-informed useful inflation measure? And um, Warren and Stephanie all talk about this as well, that, that the CBO should be scoring budget plans on the effect that it's going to have on inflation rather than what it's going to do to the deficit, which, you know, we as MMT people go, that's secondary, you know, we, you know, let the, let the deficit float around the conditions that we want to create. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts about, um, you know, what would be an MMT informed inflation measure, because that's probably going to play into your, um, your, your writing about, financing the green new deal you know you want the economy to be at capacity so how do we do yeah. you know how do we do that uh you know how do we measure inflation in a useful mmt informed way yeah no excellent so i think there are a couple things to say there um sort of right off the bat right so the first is i think a clue um as to sort of how at least to approach getting inflation right when it comes to measuring and then acting is itself found in what I'm thinking of as this renewed allocation imperative. So there are, as you guys know, um, different inflation rates in different sectors and subsectors, right? So there's a sense in which we're already um, dooming ourselves to sort of clunky policymaking if we think of there being just a single inflation rate from the get-go. And I think all of our MMT friends and colleagues would agree with that. And some of them probably even say it, although I haven't, I have to confess, we haven't been chatting a lot about inflation lately. Instead, we've been chatting about how to convince all the reactionaries that it's not a thing at this point. But, but, um, but I'm pretty, I mean, I, I think I would be very surprised if Warren in particular hasn't thought a good deal about this. Um, and at some point, we're supposed to have a conversation about it. We've been trying to figure out a time over the last two years to have a long talk about how to do this kind of sector by sector, but um, just we just kept getting backed up with other stuff. But um, in any event, that's where we begin, I think, is you, you begin by, by 
sort of explicitly recognizing that there are multiple inflations rather than one, just in the same way that uh, there are different sectors and subsectors. And because Steve Ross and all of the other um, no arbitrage, you know, orthodox finance theorists from the 60s and 70s are wrong <laughs> about arbitrage being making it the case that inflation sort of adjusts or equalizes across all subsectors virtually instantaneously, um, it does indeed make sense for appreciable intervals of time to speak about different inflation rates in different sort of subsectors. The next thing you do is then you ask yourself, all right, how would we go about looking to see whether there is inflationary pressure in each of those subsectors or sectors. And there, what you got to do is you have to do a sort of a rough equivalent, I think, within each sector to what, you know, my old mentor, Bob Schiller, used to suggest for housing um, or what Dean Baker has also suggested for housing and what Vixel, again, before all of them suggested as a sort of a general matter. Um, and that is, you basically, you look for, you don't want to be metaphysical and say, what's the, you know, what's the real interest rate here or what's the natural rate of interest or what's the natural, you know, sort of fundamental value here, which would be the kind of contemporary linguistic analog or, or counterpart to those terms. But you want to look for something that's a plausible proxy for those, right? I mean, so people oftentimes fall, they'll say, the, the only thing I don't like about Vixel is he thought there was a natural rate of interest. But that's simply... That reflects, an, a, a, I think, a misunderstanding of what the, the role that this idea of a natural rate of interest was playing in Bixel. Basically, all that Bixel means by the natural rate of interest is the non-inflation generating rate of interest, which is just, it's just his way of acknowledging the inflation constraint. He's just saying, at some point, you reach one, right? And so you don't want to generate endogenous money in excess of that point. And that's all his quote unquote natural rate is. Now, my view for what it's worth is that, you know, each sector or subsector has a kind of counterpart or analog to this idea of a natural rate or a non-inflationary rate. And that's what some people often refer to then or what the old the early 19th and late 18th century political economists would have meant by fundamental value. You can dispense with the metaphysical read on that and just say, look, what is the long-term sustainable sort of price level here, right? What, the, what you're ultimately looking for is, you know, to what extent is a flood of you know, sort of an, an out of the ordinary or outlier uh, degree of infusion of credit accounting for the rise, right? It, it, in other words, to what extent is the rate of credit growth, to what extent is the differential between the rate of credit growth in a, in a sector or subsector on the one hand and the possible rate of production growth in that same sector to what extent is a, gro a, 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 a growth of that spread attributable to a sudden infusion of credit? That's something that can be little by little refined when it comes to sort of looking for indicators and determining. So and, and to sort of get a hint as to how, you just think in terms of, like, again, what did Schiller do when he developed the K-Schiller index? He sort of says, well, let's look at what we might think of as sort of proxies for fundamental value. Um, you know, again, not, you know, eschewing any sort of metaphysical pretensions here, but just thinking in kind of pragmatic terms. Well, if land prices are not going up, if labor costs are not going up, if materials costs are not going up, if basically nothing, no input price is going up, and yet housing prices are rising, then it's probably a good bet that the credit itself is responsible for the price rise, right? Um, and so what you do then is you develop indices of those inputs and those input prices on the one hand, and then indices of the price of the interested, I mean, the, the salient asset on the other hand, and you see if they're moving in tandem. If they move in tandem, if the spread between them is more or less constant for, I don't know, 90 years or something, and then suddenly it opens up and, you know, pretty good indicator, right? And then you can look for further corroborative indication um, of, you know, a lot of credit. So you say, oh, well, maybe there's a lot of credit going in there. Let's have a look. And then you go and you drive around and you realize, hey, wait, manicurists and, you know, nail filers and stuff are offering mortgage credit or originating mortgage loans. <laughs> I guess there's some endogenous yeah. credit coming in there, right? Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe there is something happening here. And so the key, I think, would be to develop, basically to adopt that basic way of looking at things and then adapt it to every salient sector or subsector of the economy, with basically to ask, in effect, the same question. We have some capacity to do that already, but we don't have nearly the capacity that we could have if we had just been, you know, if we had known 
to, to ask the right questions from the get-go. But as you guys know better than just about, <laughs> at least as our, as our club, as our little team sort of knows probably better than anybody, um, we haven't been asking the right questions yet at all, basically, right? And so it's not terribly surprising then that we haven't developed the tools that are needed to answer the questions, at least with any degree of refinement. Um, and so I always think that once we've well and truly won the battle as to what the right questions are, and I think we're basically winning that one at this point, once that victory can be declared, it seems to me the next step is to start developing the tools to answer those questions, you know, now that we've got the right questions being posed, and then we'll be tracking the rest of it. Now that connects up with another big project. <laughs> that I'm working on at, at Cornell, at least I call it the New Indices Project. And it's basically all about tracking stuff that matters, right? Um, the first sort of entry in this big, what's ultimately going to be a big menu of New Indices, uh, we just announced at Cornell almost a year ago. Um, Fottle and Scott helped out with this too. So Dan, uh, Albert, and I have been working for a long time on this thing called the JQI, or Job Quality Index. Um, been working on that together since I think 2016 or 2017. And we finally came out with it officially last uh, November. Um, so it's just a Cornell JQI, which is, and we basically think, okay, what well, we ought to track, at least if you're looking at jobs, is not sort of the employment rate. You should be looking at job quality. And that's in terms of, you know, hourly pay plus hour, you know, multiply by hours. And it's very easy to sort of see why everything is sort of fucked up. Um, if you actually track the JQI, QI performance instead of the you know employment rate, um, but anyway, that's just that's the just the beginning of what's meant to be a long term project with lots of new indices that would track lots of stuff that would be relevant. And I think if we're asking the right questions, as we're talking about right now, that itself gives a pretty good clue um, as to what the next indices ought to be. You know, and God knows we have the resources to you know, yeah. including mathematical resources as well as sort of financial resources and public employee resources to, uh, you know, to generate all kinds of useful uh, measures to sort of track this stuff correctly or, or well. Maybe one last one, if I could, if just, um, just to throw in. Um, I also think we ought to have, there's something, uh, another proposal, it's a sort of in the Green New Deal finance book. It's also in the part of the Capital Commons project is something I think we really ought to establish. I call it, you know, sort of Academically, you could call it a price stabilization fund. I call it the people's portfolio. But the idea would be that you would maintain a big portfolio of assets um, generated by or issued by various uh, firms across the economy. And if the prices of certain uh, goods or services or certain indices of prices are what we can think of as systemically important, sort of in the same way that SIFPs, systemically important financial institutions are, we shouldn't hesitate to have the Fed short or go long uh, in some of those securities in order to adjust or influence those prices. There's a sense in which I, I call these SIPPs, systemically important prices and indices. Um, there's a sense in which we've implicitly recognized that there are SIPPs already, right? I mean, the, in, the money rental rate, i.e. the interest rate that the yeah. Fed manages, it collars it. The whole idea is to keep it from, you know, make sure that it, it sort of stays within a band. That's essentially modulation, right? You sort of, you go long or you go short in treasuries to influence it. We sort of recognize that about housing prices too. That's why the Fed has so many mortgage-related assets on on the on the balance sheet now, um, including private sector, you know, private label um, uh, mortgage products. We've sort of we sort of are recognizing it when we talk about the job guarantee, right? If, at least insofar as we talk about the the wage uh, paid through the JG as a kind of a base or baseline. That's recognizing prevailing wage rates as being systemically important. There are a lot of other things that are systemically important in that way, like commodity prices, fuel prices, and others. Um, I don't think we should be shy about maybe, you know, sort of basically having a giant mutual fund, we can just call it like the market fund, or again, the, the people's portfolio, um, and have the Fed or some other instrumentality on a regular basis, buying and selling securities to sort of keep at least the systemically important prices within manageable bounds. I just wanted to clarify whether that was kind of an, I guess, soft approach price control mechanism. Isn't it's it? sort of like it, um, except that the, the cool thing about it is it uses a different method of influencing the price that on the one hand, I think it's probably a little bit less offensive to libertarian sensibilities than outright price controls. But um, but also, and I think more plausibly and more importantly, is it's much more fine-tunable. It's much more, you know, in the same way that open market operations are, right? And the analogy here would be like, you can think of like two different ways that the Fed might uh, affect interest rates, right? One is it might simply raise 
the interbank lending rate, right, that the Fed Reserve member banks uh, charge one another to do their overnight lending. So you could just say, okay, we're changing the interbank lending rate, or we're changing the discount rate uh, pursuant to which we purchase certain forms of paper. That's that's a kind of outright price control where you're just saying the price shall be X. But the other way to do it is through the so-called open market operations, whereby the Fed, uh, the, the New York Fed's uh, trading desk every morning literally buys and sells treasury securities with a view to kind of fine-tuning the money supply that day on the basis of reams and reams and reams of data that have been analyzed and crunched by supercomputers the night before. So this is something that almost nobody knows about because it's just so recondite. But, but you know, every single day there are public, there are quasi-public employees at the New York Fed who are just basically making trades with dealer banks on Wall Street simply in order to affect the money supply on a daily, even sort of hourly basis, you could almost right. say. Um, right. And that's a much more responsive, quickly changeable, um, you know, kind of fast sort of acting way of doing things. And so the analog here, then, you could say that basically the, the, the discount rate or the interbank lending rate that the Fed applies, that would be the price control analog. And then what I'm suggesting is more the open market operations analog. It's a form of, of, of OMO, right, of open market operations, but you just sort of... Uh, extend uh, to other systemic support prices additional to uh, prevailing interest rates. And by the way, this would be really helpful if we then started doing the inflation measuring in that more fine-grained way that we were talking about a moment ago, where you look from market to market, because you could say, okay, look, you know, if prices are inflating, uh, you know, in, in, in the way that we mean by inflating, uh, in a particular sector or subsector, Fed could just put downward pressure on that stuff. It could just sh short the the, the the associated financial instruments. If, on the other hand, it's deflating, if it's if prices are dropping below what they really probably ought to be as far as long term sustainability goes, and there's it's owing to some kind of irrational panic or something in the subsector in question, then the Fed can sort of again act counter cyclically by buying a bunch of that stuff and acting as a kind of buyer of last resort. And that would be a way of modulating price swings that, at least insofar as those swings are attributable to something other than quote unquote fundamentals, right? Namely, sudden credit crunches or sudden credit gluts within those subsectors, thanks to FAD investing or, or what have you. So it would be a really fine tuned. Um, I think really kind of stay there. Another way to think about it, I think of it as sort of like that you can compare it to the difference between fuel injection, uh, um, motor car engines uh, of the kind that we have today and the old carburetor um, fueled engines of the past, you know, this, all those muscle cars that used to be popular in the States, you know, the, you know, giant, you know, 450 cubic centimeter engines that had these like these weird carburetor things, you know, it's going to glop all this fuel and air together, supposedly mixing it together and then spraying it into these cylinders, but it was a god awful mess. Not very, you know, not very efficient. Um, in a sense, that's sort of what our, a lot of our mon monetary policy tools, I think are still in the kind of yeah. carburation phase of development. And what we really are looking to do is to move into what we might think of as a kind of fuel injection uh, stage of development. And we certainly have the wherewithal. It's, it's just, again, we just, nobody ever asks the right questions. And so then you don't have the right tool. This is like if Bruce Springsteen did economics. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, we might prefer Bruce Springsteen to Brian Eno musically, but I think when it comes to you know sort of monetary policy instruments, I think I'd rather have Brian Eno. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's happened um, uh, since two thousand and eight is you've had a lot of people going. Uh, QE is printing money, and it's going to lead to hyperinflation. And then twelve years goes by. <laughs> And it's any minute now, any minute now, there's going to be hyperinflation. And, and, and of course, there's not hyperinflation, but there is asset price inflation. And so people go, yeah, there, you see, we told you. That's the inflation that your money printing did. Now, the way I understand it is what's happened is you've taken this ultra safe asset off the market by QE. You've reversed, you've, you know, the, the central bank's gone into the market, into the secondary market and exchanged interest bearing, uh, risk-free interest bearing assets for plain old dollars or pounds, unsexy, no interest pounds. So that money is now looking for somewhere to go and it's gone into 
all kinds of other things, you know, fina- you know, financial assets and property and stuff like that. People call that asset price inflation. And it bothers me because surely the problem isn't that there's been money created or not been created. It's like there's not enough housing. That's why the price has gone up. So it's a market signal. It's not inflation. That's the way I look at it. But yeah, no, no. I mean, I think, I mean, for what it's worth, Christian, I mean, I, th- I think it seems to me that you're looking at it in exactly the right way, or at least it's the way I look at it as well. Um, I think the, the reason there's a kind of apparent conflict in what you and I are thinking here on the one hand, and those people who say, see, I told you so, look at that asset price inflation. Uh, on the other hand, I think is because there's a kind of uh, equivocation going on with respect to the word inflation and, and the sort of valence or significance of that word, right? Um, if we just use the word, you know, inflation simpliciter, so to speak, and we just think inflation as such is just always a bad thing. Um, and then somebody can point to some prices that are going up and they are going up solely because there's more money being put into the system by the Fed. Uh, well, then, yeah, then it looks bad because that's inflation and it is happening, blah, blah, blah. But um, if, on the other hand, we're sort of thinking, okay, look, um, there's not just whether prices are going up sort of for artificial reasons. There's also the question of whether that's either a bad thing or a sort of signal of some suboptimality, something, some falling short of optimality. Um, as for whether it's a bad thing, um, there are times when it can be a bad thing if you have a hyperinflation in the asset markets because those tend to crash, right? The bubbles tend ultimately to burst. Um, but when you're not at the point of a, of a burst and when you need some kind of stimulus out there, it might very well be better than nothing, right? The sort of the wealth effect, so to speak, that's sort of generated by it can sort of help prevent an economy from totally collapsing, which I think is sort of what's happening at the moment, right? That the economy is sort of being prevented from total terminal collapse through, um, in effect, asset price inflation and the kind of wealth effect that that generates among rentiers, right? And and businesses um, who sort of either are themselves rentiers or depend upon rentiers. But that all being said, um, it does nevertheless, I think, signal a, a sort of suboptimality and it's just the suboptimality in a way that we were talking about before. It's essentially that known. It's it's a misallocation, right? It's a signal of the fact that we just don't have the right wiring. So you know, if if basically, here's a way to think about it. Imagine you have like, um, let's say that I'm, I'm looking out at that outdoor deck that I was talking to you guys on before, so you can kind of imagine it. So it's like I know 50 feet. Uh, from one end to the other. Um, and let's imagine that there's like a heating, uh, let's let's imagine it's getting chilly like it is now, you know, it's sort of, sort of feeling like it's beginning to feel autumnal now. So imagine in about two weeks, it's even colder and people are out there having drinks in the evening and it starts getting cold. And so we want to kind of heat things up. Um, if there's basically one sort of flame jet, so to speak, at one end of that 50 foot deck, um, and yet the places where people sit or over, it's over at the other end of the deck. Well, we can turn up the fire really, 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 really high at the one end of the 50 feet. And at some point, it'll be a big enough fire that it'll warm us over at the other end of the deck. And that's better than freezing, I suppose, at least provided that we don't set the, set the building alight, right? Um, but imagine, and, and we might say, okay, this is, this is a real question, right? Is there a danger of setting the building alight or is there not? If there's not, go ahead and do it. If there is, well, do it until it looks like we're getting to the danger point, then turn it down and get cold again. But you know what would be even cooler is if we just said, well, why is the fucking fire jet 50 feet away? You know, why don't we have this sort of heat evenly distributed over the entirety of the deck, right? So that basically you can sit anywhere on this deck and be warmed up. Um, That would be better. And that's sort of the fuel injector analogy, you might say, right? So if we had actually means of getting stimulus money to in, in a kind of, to people in a kind of more pinpointed or fine tuned or sort of well directed way, which is just another way to say if we could do the allocation right, then we wouldn't have to sort of undermodulate, so to speak, or i.e. over generate, right? Um, so I think what we're doing at the moment is we're over generating um, because we have to um, because the alternative is freezing to death, right? And we're risk, we're risking conflagration somewhere down the road. We're nowhere near it at the moment. But we're at least making it conceivable that there might be conflagration one day by doing what we're doing right now, particularly because we've done it this way. This is how we've been doing it for 50 years now. Basically, the only thing that keeps the whole everything from falling apart is effectively the equivalent of the Greenspan put, just done again and again and again before Greenspan and after Greenspan. 
And again, that's better than doing nothing um, if the alternative is subsistence level production or unemployment rates of, you know, 80% or something. But, you know, wouldn't it be kind of better if, you know, again, if you didn't, just, if you didn't have to let a bonfire at one end of the deck to warm people at the other end, but instead could just have like smaller heating units <laughs> sort of evenly distributed all the way across the deck. And that's what, we're, what we have to do. That's one reason, by the way, for the Fed wallet uh, proposal, right? That's one reason for, the, for doing that addition to the, the liability side of the Fed balance sheet, I think, because you could just do immediate helicopter, digital helicopter drops to everybody who needs the money. And note that it wouldn't have to take the form of credit. You just drop the fucking stuff into the wallets. It doesn't have to be paid back. It just has to be spent, you know? And then again, if at some point there's too much of that and it's generating inflation somewhere where you care about it in the more immediate term rather than the, than the longer term, like, for example, in the consumer goods markets, then you can always, you know, do a number of things to adjust. You can rein it back in or slow down the rate of, of injections into people's wallets. You can uh, have the Fed uh, short um, uh, financial securities that are associated with the goods whose prices are rising to put downward pressure on them. Any number of policy tools like that that you could do. And all of this would be effectively the kind of equivalent of fuel injecting instead of carburating, I think. Uh, you've sparked my imagination <laughs> with, this, uh, with this kind of fuel injections. Um, and I was wondering whether, you know, that could be, because we're, we're assuming that in this system, everybody is kind of plugged into the system. In a sense. Yeah. And yeah. whether, you know, there was something that could be done to identify maybe people within that system who are struggling financially and who require more injection than others. And, yeah. you know, I, and I was just thinking about what kind of signals would we be looking for? For example, people who maybe, maybe spending too much on interest rates on, 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 re, on card mm -hmm. repayments, you know, or, or something like that, you know? There are a lot of ways I think you could, you could, you could do this, Patricia, in some ways we sort of already have, in other ways would be, I think, maybe refinements that we could develop uh, to the way we do things now, right? So, I mean, one of the principal ways that we sort of identify um, tar what they call target populations here, which is a little, little ominous sounding, um, <laughs> is by looking at prior tax returns. Um, so, first of all, um, if you have people who have social security numbers, um, which are basically everybody gets at birth. If you have social security numbers that have no tax returns at all associated with them in the big database, that's a pretty good indicator of indigence or minority. And I mean, age-wise minority, like you haven't reached the age of majority yet. So you're either a child or you are economically not very well to do or well off um, if you haven't been filing tax returns. Um, so that's one indicator that this might be a group uh, or a demographic, so to speak, of, of folk who would be um, more likely than not uh, to be in need of, of some fuel injection, so to speak, you know, during a downturn. Uh, another one would be people who had filed tax returns, but in order to receive so-called negative income taxes, that's just the uh, EITC, the Earned Income Tax Credit, right? Mm -hmm. So some, some people qualify under EITC to receive more back from the federal government than they have to pay in in the form of taxes. It's a kind of reverse income tax. Um, it's, sort of, it's a sort of a lesser version of what Milton Friedman and Richard Nixon, of all people, advocated or were, were sort of intrigued by in the early 70s. So we are able to track those folk as well, uh, and they might then be very good candidates for receipt of, uh, of wallet injections, you might say. Then, um, abstracting away from those two sort of somewhat marginal cases, or sort of you might think of these as boundary cases, if you get sort of smack dab in the middle uh, of where everybody is paying taxes, um, the tax returns themselves are usually a pretty good indicator of, uh, of income, right? Um, particularly because the tax is, is, is geared to income. It's even called an income tax. So you can say that, look, okay, um, maybe everybody who's earning 25000 per year or less um, should get X injection, right? And everybody earning, you know, 40000 or less should get, I don't know, X minus 20% or X minus 30% or whatever, right? And so you could kind of gear it that way. Uh, and I don't think, I, I, my guess would be that even wealthy people would not object to graduating it in a kind of progressive way like that because they would presumably understand, look, I don't, I don't really need that. I don't need the help. Um, and furthermore, uh, more stimulus to the economy is likely to be afforded because, of course, as we know, since our friend Keynes again um, wrote to this effect, um, that those who are sort of not at the top of the distribution 
distribution tend to have higher propensities to consume. And so they're more likely to spend than to save or invest in the stock market than the extra that they have. So I think we could do, and that would be a start, seems to me. Um, we could also in, just, in, that would be, that would be a start that would operate in a kind of automatic way, right? We could say we, we, we have sort of immediate lists generated of folk who are more likely than not uh, to be um, good, well-chosen beneficiaries of helicopter drops, right? Um, you could also uh, sort of simultaneously invite applications, so to speak. You could sort of ask people who believe that they need the help um, to apply for it and submit maybe certain kinds of information that would be thought to be indicative of dessert, so to speak, or, or, or otherwise, uh, like, you know, sort of, it would be sort of similar to the process of applying for um, uh, unemployment insurance or the, the dole uh, in, in UK terms. Just wanted to step over the Atlantic for a second, over uh -huh. here in Britain. Just, um, we've got a couple of hardworking MMT enthusiasts at the moment who are trying to do a sort of Stephanie Bell style investigation into all the spreadsheet interactions at the Bank of England. Because right. when you're not an American MMT, -er, uh, people think the onus is on you to prove. <laughs> that say <laughs> the Bank of England <laughs> or the Reserve Bank of Australia, the Bank of Canada, that they all work the same way as the Fed. Could you say anything that could help British MMTers push back on this idea that MMT only applies to the US because something, something reserve currency or something, something petrodollar? People go, oh, you know, the, the, the scholarly work's only been done on the Fed. What are your thoughts? So um, you guys have maybe you've seen this. Um, there's, there's a lot of really good stuff that's been put out by the BOV itself mm -hmm. on how it's generated. Right? I know that um, the positive money people sort of make a big, big play of that uh, stuff, or they say use that stuff a lot. But that's one way to kind of begin, at least, because you know whatever reservations um, we might have with some of the things that are said in some of those videos or in some of those white papers and the like, um, a lot of it at least directly addresses the sort of the crude version of this challenge, which is that, well, the Fed can do that, but the Bank of England can't. And you say, well, B of E seems to think it can. You know, look at this. You know, um, that's one way to sort of start. Um, a second, um, I think a, a second way to sort of do this is, is as follows. You could say that um, the reserve currency status of the dollar, uh, you know, globally speaking, does make it somewhat easier for the U.S. to do the MMT thing that, um, than 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 some other countries, but but only easier in a particular sense, right? If we if we if we take it back down to those sort of fundamentals that ultimately the MMTers themselves, um, even the canonical figures themselves, typically do, that is real resources. Uh, uh, and then the money that's used to sort of to purchase them uh, or to command them in, in econo speak. Um, you know, the, the only real advantage that the U.S. derives from the reserve currency status is that insofar as it has to import to satisfy its material needs, it doesn't have to pay as much as it might otherwise have had to pay, right, for the stuff that it has to import. Um, but, you know, the U.S. doesn't really, you know, import that huge a chunk, or at least doesn't have to import that huge a chunk of what it brings in. Now, one way to sort of then do, a, uh, I think, a kind of a useful comparison would be to sort of focus on, all right, how much does Britain actually have to import uh, to satisfy its needs? And how much is it able sort of domestically to kind of generate? Um, and then you could say, well, whatever portion is domestically doable uh, is immediately um, fit for, you know, MMT type thinking, right? Because here you don't, here you here being the issuer of your own currency sort of matters because you're using your own currency to command literally your own resources. The only way in which Britain's capacities as a as an issuer would would fall short of the American capacities would I think be essentially the degree to which Britain relies more on on, on imports. Right. Then the next thing to note, I suppose, would be that most of what Britain imports or at least what it has to import, most of what it has to import, is pretty, you know, low value added stuff, right? Isn't it basically just, you know, actually you don't even, you probably don't even, I probably shouldn't talk about carbon fuels anyway, because we, we want to get off of those. But insofar as Britain uses carbon fuels, I guess the, the North Sea oil is still a pretty large chunk of the supply, right? Um, and you grow an awful lot of what you require to, to, to nourish yourselves. Or I mean, could do. We, 
or could, right? Yeah, if we leave yeah. to one side the sort yeah. of luxury stuff and yeah. or the un, you know the unnecessary, um, you know, I mean, sure, I, Britain probably couldn't be completely autarkic any more than the U.S. could be completely autarkic. But um, if you use autarky as the kind of the baseline measure, like possible, let's say plausible autarky as the kind of baseline, then you can say whatever, however far we want to exceed plausible autarky, is the degree to which we're constrained you know, is the degree to which a, a so-called inflation constraint or resource constraint could kick in. Because that just, by definition, is the resource constraint, right? Um, and, yeah, sure, Britain being a smaller island nation is somewhat more resource constrained than the U.S. is. But not as much as people might think, um, you know. And that, I think, is probably a, a useful sort of way, sort of starting point after one points out that the Bank of England seems to think that Britain is yeah. a currency issue. But um, that's that's the way I would go about it, I think. Um, sort of simply, you know, I've, I've thought about this a little bit in connection with Japan as well, right? Um, Japan, of course. I think Japan probably has less capacity to be autarkic even in the UK, right? Because it's so densely populated. Um, and so much of the land, I believe, is non-arable. But I might haven't haven't checked lately what the what the stats are on you know what percentage of the land is uh, is is arable. But but in any event, you know, any sort of continent spanning um, jurisdiction like the U.S. or Russia, uh, to a somewhat lesser extent China or Australia, um, you know, has a little bit is is less. It, it won't feel the resource constraint maybe as quickly as some other countries will. But even there, we can overstate it. Like Australia, I mean. Think about Canada, right? People, Canada, second biggest landmass in the world, blah, blah. But there's a reason that, you know, almost everybody lives within like 200 miles of the U.S. You know, they're all sort of in the southern sort of strip of Canada. The north is all sort of tundra, right? And um, my understanding of Australia is that, you know, you pretty much have to live along the coasts or you're going to burn to death. <laughs> so, um, so it's, it's, it's more resource constrained than people realize. And U.S. sort of similar, particularly given that we've kind of maxed out a lot of what we had. You know, we've used up a lot of what we once had. First of all, we can simplify it and just go at the really base level. You just go, look, pull the five pound note out of your pocket. Who issues that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. does it originate in the private sector and then the government's yeah. come yeah. in and captured it? And we we just know that, that legally that's not how it works, you know. Never was, yeah. There are a number of different angles um, that are sort of differentially or variably accessible to sort of untutored intuition um, that one can employ. And I'm usually a kind of let a thousand flowers bloom kind of guy. I'm a, I'm a Maoist about most of these <laughs> things, which is, you know, try every angle until yeah, yeah, one yeah. of them or some cum some particular accumulation um, sort of sticks. Um, but one is exactly what you, you say, right? That, um, you know, you point to the, the bill itself. I mean, here in the U.S., it's really easy. You pull out the dollar bill, you read across, you tell them, read across the top, says Federal Reserve note. You say, is that a note from Chairman Powell to his girlfriend? Or what, what, do, you, what, do, you, what do you think that note means? And then they say, oh, I don't know. And I say, well, have you ever heard of a promissory note? Say, yeah. And you say, well, it's a Fed promissory note. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's basically just a promissory obligation. It's just a, a, essentially a tradable representation of a promise. Um, there was a time when that was a promise to hand over a certain quantum of gold if you, you know, handed it over at the, at the teller window, but that's been like a century. Um, and now it's best read as a kind of promise to count this in fulfillment of your tax obligation, right? It's, it says at the bottom also, it's legal tender, good for all obligations, public and private meaning including taxes. It's, there's an equivalent, of course, when it comes to the, the, the British pound note. Um, you know, it's not, of course, you know, Federal Reserve note, but there's a reason that the Queen is on the front of the thing uh, and not Keith Richards, right, or, 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 Manny, or Manny Pacquiao with his pack coin. Um, that sort of suggests something, right? Um, another thing that I find helpful, and you guys might find this helpful too, this this is initially, it kind of strikes people as being really wild, but then the more they think about it, it begins to kind of sink in. I always tell people, look, when you go to a bank uh, and you take out a loan, what you're really doing is you're temporarily swapping, and people have heard the word swap at least, you're, you're essentially engaging in a, a temporary currency swap. You're swapping a private promissory note for a public promissory note. And then they say, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, think about it. You know, when you hear loan, you don't, you don't tend to disaggregate it into its component parts. But have you ever taken out a loan? And if they have, they say, yeah. Say, do you remember the sort of the various steps you went through? You know, you had to have the credit checked and all that stuff. You jumped through this hoop, that hoop, blah, blah. But what was the sort of final ritual act? 
acts that you did. Didn't you sign something? And they said, yeah. Didn't it say promissory note across the top? Yeah. That's the same use of the word note as in the Federal Reserve note. So what you've effectively done is you've swapped your private promissory note for either a Fed promissory note or what's called its fiduciary equivalent, namely its bank account equivalent. And then they'll say, why would you want to do that? And so well, I can't. You, uh, uh, he said, well, it's because you can't spend your, your, your private promissory note isn't legal tender. Um, and this is, of course, I'm basically just playing on the old Minsky observation that anybody can uh, issue a currency, but the, the trick is to get it accepted, right? What you're doing is you're saying, you know, you're temporarily swapping a private note for a public note in order to be able to spend the public note. And you might say, well, why do we do this? Why does the public empower these institutions? to do currency swaps for us, private for public. Well, maybe because we think it's productive. Maybe because we think if you extend credit to people, they can use that credit to generate more wealth in their lives. And by you know, generating more good or more wealth or more value in their lives, they're benefiting themselves, plus they're benefiting the society as a whole. And we view that as a kind of a good thing for a public to do, for a, a republic, um, our race publica, to do. Um, and basically, anytime things are kind of fucked up, it's because in one way or another, things have departed from that picture, right? So for example, if the swap is being done not to finance some public, some productive activity that you need a temporary command over resources that you don't already own in order to engage in, but instead you're just using that money to bet on price movements, like basically go and pull a slot machine lever. Well, then it means that all that all that swapping is being done not for productive purposes, but for merely speculative purposes. So why are we surprised that you know everything's falling apart, materially speaking, while the stock market you know reaches new heights, even as you know two hundred thousand people have now died. Um, but in any event, so the the swap idea might have some appeal to some folk, at least once they get past the initial air of sort of paradox, especially if you can sort of point out that the sense in which the, uh, the pound note is a note. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then there are various other angles as well. And there's one, a lot of our sort of MMT fellow travelers or, or, or allies will say that, well, how do you pay your taxes? What do you pay it with? And then, well, money, I hand over the money. Well, where did that, you know, what is it? Did you generate them? Did you print the money? I hope not. Otherwise, you, you're going to prison. Um, you know, that money has to have gotten into the economy somehow in order for you to spend it back on your taxes or pay it back. Where did it come from? You know, and it, it, can you point to me any money that doesn't have evidence on it to the effect that it actually came from the authority that you're paying it to? Shouldn't that be enough to show you that the spending has to precede the taxing? Um, but, you know, I tend to use all of those angles and as many as it, so I'm going to riff on Mario Draghi. Um, I, I, I use as many as it takes, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. I, I kind of attack it from as many angles as I can. And, and usually at some point it, it, it sort of kicks in because the, the kind of the great, I think one advantage that we have here, or at least one blessing in the, in the challenge that we're, that we're faced with is that at least it's not a, at least it's a kind of a 180 degree switch that we have to do right you know what i mean it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's almost like a copernican sort of thing you simply move from um, you know uh, terra centrism to heliocentrism you know you say well what if we go around the sun rather than the sun going around us that somehow is intuitively more tractable you know in other words the opposite of something is almost more appreciable than yeah. something that is different from something else in a more kind of vague, less complete sort of way. Yeah, yeah. Because there's a kind of a, the brain can do a sort of systematic translation. You'd say, just do a photographic negative. You know, anything that was, you know, if, 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 if uh, you know, Christian has dark hair and light skin, imagine him with light hair and dark skin. And then that's the MMT uh, <laughs> yeah. Christian, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it, you know, I mean, it, it's like a little, it's a little, intuitively, it's easier yeah. to explain if it's just a, a, a flip. And in effect, that's what we're doing. We're just flipping. Um, also, you know, another one that's helpful for that very reason is just if you just sort of say to people, look, and I, I invite you to embark on the following a thought experiment. What if, you know, deposits didn't make loans, but loans made deposits? And just again, a total 180 degree flip. And they say, oh, well, how could that be or whatever? And you sort of then explain how that happens, how that works, right? And here in the States, it's really easy to explain that in a way. You just say, well, look, imagine that I... Bob um, were to open an account. Let's say Christian comes to Bob and wants to borrow money from him. 
uh, and I say, Christian, I'm happy to lend you money. But instead of lending, basically pulling Federal Reserve notes or, or pound notes out of my pocket, handing them over to Christian, uh, instead, I issue to him a card, a really impressive looking plastic card that has my beautiful image on it. And it has a little sort of chip at the end or, a, or an electromagnetic strip. It basically looks like a bank card. It looks really cool. And I say, hey, voila, here's your card. Um, I've, I've credited the $500 that I'm lending to you to your card account go knock yourself out and you know what's going to happen well christian's going to go and take my card over to the Dwayne reed across the street's drugstore you know or what you guys call a chemist he's going to go to boots the chemist and he's going to you know stick this you know in, insert the chip card or swipe the strip card and there's going to be a big fat fucking nothing that happens you know it's just they're all going to look at him um so yeah what's this card well, it's a bob card it's a bob card i have 500 pounds on this bob card and nothing's going to happen and then you ask the person your interlocutor who doesn't get this stuff yet? You say, why? Why would it be that way? Why? Why would it happen that way? Well, because you're not a bank. I mean, you're not authorized to sort of issue cards like this. You can't credit my account in this and and in in, in in the very doing of it. Um, give me spendable money. And I say, yeah, you're right. Okay, but now you do this to a bank. What makes it possible for the bank to do it? Is it because it has some money in a vault or something? I mean, what does the money in the vault have to do with that bank card? Well, it's because it's like part of it's authorized. Like the system recognizes the card, you know, that that little machine, that chip reader is like hooked up with, you know, through wires and all sorts of, you know, transmission mechanisms to a, a payment system. And what do you know, this particular card counts in this system, right? Uh, and, and then you just sort of say, so what determines whether it counts? Who decides that? You say, well, whoever administers the payment system. Well, who does that? Well, in the US, it's the Fed. Um, in the UK, it's I think it's the Bank of England, or if it's not, it's the Bank of England acting in consortium with some other public authority. But it's basically public authority. And so what I often do, I often, this is a, it's a little bit where it's track sounding at first, but I'll often tell people I'm talking with who are sort of trying to get their, quote unquote, get their heads around it, as they say here. Uh, in the states is just, i'll say the thing you got to remember about a money also is that a money is always part of a sort of system it's part of a game as it were it's a, it's like a something that you can make moves with in a game uh and a money is one way to think about it if you think in those terms is you say the money is simply that which counts for purposes of payment right that's all we all we mean when we call it legal tender is this counts in payment other things don't if chris wants to sell me let's say uh, i'm sorry christian has um, like a, an old uh, british uh, 1965 austin healy sprite you know some really vintage british sports car and he wants to sell it to me and i say well here christian i'm going to pay you and i just offer him my spectacles here you go and it's not gonna, if he doesn't accept it, it's not going to count in payment right but if on the other hand i give him you know a certain number of pound notes that add up to the value that he's charging for the car, it counts, it works, right? And the bank cards and the, the strip cards and the chip cards and the little blips on your uh, Apple phone or, or your iPhone, or whatever, those all count. And what determines whether they count is public authority, right? And that's what makes it possible for a bank to generate money in that sense, right? It's In effect, the Fed just said, yeah, you, we, you just did what we require you to do to create some money. This goes to what Keynes said. Governments have been, or authorities have been deciding what is and isn't money for 4,000 years at least. <laughs> the last yeah, 4,000 years yeah. at least. Yeah. Right from the get-go. Yeah, it's always been that way, right? Yeah. Um, and that's really not that surprising. If you think, even if you think of like a pre-Westphalian society or just like, even like a village or something, right? There's, there's probably a social practice of if, if you don't have a kind of pure central provisioning or rationing sort of economy, but there's some kind of exchange that happens, even if it takes the form of gift or barter or whatever, um, some stuff counts and some stuff doesn't, you know, even, even if we wanted to get so primitive that we weren't even quite monetary yet in the kind of modern sense, at least. And, you know, Christian has a beaver pelt and, you know, I've got like a pair of antlers or I've got something I've made out of an antler. Um, and, you know, Christian says, I'll trade the one for the other. Um, you know, we have a social practice that basically is saying that, well, Christian has the right to determine what he's going to accept in payment. Uh, and if I don't abide by what he accepts in payment, then I'm basically stealing from him. Um, and that's all socially determined, you know, what counts and what doesn't count, what's a legitimate transaction or, or trade and what's not. And in a way, you know, even though, of course, it's, it's always risky to sort of 
make too much of analogies between money payment and barter since, you know, we're sort of trying to get away from that. And since, you know, primitive Ricardian models of the economy pretend that it's all barter. Um, there are some remaining similarities between barter and money payment that are worth keeping in mind from time to time when we're talking to naive folk, it seems to me. And one of them is this, right? That basically uh, barter is itself a social practice. It's a practice pursuant to which some things satisfy payment obligations and other things don't. And if we generalize from there, we can say, okay, money just is the most abstract form of satisfaction of a payment obligation, which is another way of saying it's that which counts. And that is as socially determined now is it as it was when we lived in tribal societies where I would give you a beaver pelt in return for a tomahawk or something, you know, or whatever, um, you know, it's still a social practice. Um, and the social practice then deter determines what's monetary. And if you can, if that practice includes the capacity to say, et voila, your account has just been credited. Now you can buy stuff off of this account, irrespective of whether anything moved in a vault or anything. That's that, you know, that's an end of the matter. And then, of course, that immediately brings out the, yeah, but if there's a whole bunch of that going on, <laughs> then there's going to be inflation, you know? I said, well, yeah, of course. That's yeah. that's why we have macro prudential regulation. That's why we have central banking. Um, you know, you, thanks for, you, you made a great case just now for central banking. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you don't want to end the Fed. <laughs> Look, we've come all this way. We haven't talked enough about the books. One of them's called Money from Nothing. And the other one's called Financing the Green New Deal. Yeah. Tell us what we need to know about these books. I mean, we've gone into a lot of uh, the prescriptions, I, I imagine, or some of the prescriptions. Sure. No, so, so a lot of what we've been talking about is sort of, um, it is stuff that's covered in, in one, or, one or the other or both of, of, of the books. Um, maybe starting with the, with the money from nothing one first. This is the one, this kind of uh, links up nicely with the sort of the background, the sort of mathematical philosopher type guy that I was before I decided to go into uh, finance and law. Um, so my co-author on that one, Aaron James, is a philosopher, a uh, good friend, uh, probably best known here in the States for uh, a wonderful sort of tongue-in-cheek uh, book that he put out in 2012 called Assholes, A Theory. Uh, and it's basically a kind of moral philosophic account of what constitutes the asshole, which is a, a sort of you know social phenomenon that is not, of course, unique to the U.S., um, but seems to be a particularly well developed form uh, at this point uh, here in the U.S. Um, and so it's a kind of a, it's a lovely sort of tongue in cheek philosophic account um, that sort of begins in the kind of traditional philosophic way, defining terms, you know, going all sort of platonic first and then sort of elaborating. And so Aaron has um, so we both share philosophic backgrounds. Um, um, although his is more in moral philosophy and mine is more in mathematical. But Aaron also, because of his moral philosophic background, has a long-standing interest in economic arrangements and, uh, and money as well. So we decided to uh, do this book together because we're both sort of something between philosophers and money thinkers, you might say. Um, but we thought we'd make it kind of fun and tongue-in-cheekish, or just cheeky, I guess, in British terms, um, sort of in the way the Assholes book is, but in a slightly more detailed kind of way because we want it to be we, we actually want it to be possible for even for you know sophisticated people who think that they already uh, are experts in economics to learn from it but we also want to present it in a mode that makes it immediately accessible to folk who have never read anything that's even remotely economic before that's the hope at least and so what we basically do is we just sort of start from the ground up we just sort of you know develop an account of money, uh, which is based on promise and tradeability of promises and legal tender and, and the role that a social practice, which then hardens or crystallizes into a set of institutions, plays in determining what counts as money. And then dri deriving from all of that, the, the sort of a full sort of uh, kind of a how should I put sort of a fully elaborated um, set of options that we can instantly recognize that we actually have as a people, as a, as a we rather than a bunch of eyes, um, once we recognize that this is what money does. So in that sense, we're sort of doing what MMTers are always trying to do, but coming at it from a somewhat different angle, sort of grounded again in a kind of, you could think of it as sort of popular moral philosophy or popular political philosophy. So whereas the MMT or the typical MMT move is to begin with the sovereign um, and then talk about the currency as a, as a sovereign issuance, um, what we, we try to unpack 
the, the notion of sovereignty itself in this connection. Like, what, are, what do we mean when we're talking about a sovereign that's doing this? And we try to ground it in a kind of political theory that's broadly sort of Rousseauian, Republican. Um, in fact, a lot of my, a lot of the sort of thinking that I've done in connection with the book kind of grows out of um, work that I did on another big piece that I have out there called Rousseauian money. That's essentially a derivation of a money as a kind of almost as if it were a, the, the unwritten book of, uh, of Rousseau's uh, Contrat Social. So it's a kind of a, a, re, a classical Republican account of money in that sense, or of sovereignty and hence of sovereign money. Um, we also then um, play, pay a lot of attention uh, to the kind of micro detail of the private sector institutions that are hooked up to the sovereign in constituting the money system. So this is where a lot of sort of, you could say we, we go, we're very sort of Vixellian, you might say, in those aspects. And all of that, of course, is MMT friendly. Um, it's simply that the emphasis is placed in somewhat differently. Like MMT tends to focus largely on the operations of the central bank, which is critical, has to be done. And we, we do that as well. Um, we try to pay a little bit of extra attention as well to the, the kind of hybrid, uh, what I call franchisee institutions that are nominally private sector, but they're hooked, are licensed by the public sector and sort of hooked up to the public sector in such a way as to render them really only quasi-private. So I'm basically, in other words, talking about banks, but also shadow banks, the various sort of other kinds of financial intermediaries that are increasingly like, like uh, banks these days. Um, and then we derive a number of policy proposals and sort of explain, you know, why you could do this, why you can do that. And some of it has to do with the Fed wallet stuff for the, I mean, there's the, the sort of the Fed wallet type proposal is in there. The, the idea of direct digital helicopter dropping is in there. Um, the idea of a kind of people's portfolio where you can short or long various things in order to affect prices uh, in various markets and sub markets or sectors and subsectors is in there. So in many ways, it's a kind of a book version of this conversation. You know? Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> a way so, to expand on the issues that we've discussed. Yeah. The other one, the Financing the Green New Deal book is sort of similarly so, uh, except there the focus is much more, there's a great, uh, there's much more detail on sort of institutional things that can be done, reforms that can be made and institutions that can be established. Whereas there's very little, uh, if any, sort of theory talk to justify it, uh, and that owes to the very basically to the provenance of the thing. So, as you guys know, I helped out the AOC team um, in sort of developing the Green New Deal and, and drafting the Green New Deal resolution back in late 2018 and early 2019. Um, and once that was announced, once the resolution you know was proposed in Congress, and you know various debates and things happened, um, at about about maybe three four months into you know after the resolution had been proposed, the um, AOC's chief of staff um, asked me if I would basically put together a finance plan to sort of show not only that but uh, but how. Um, the Green New Deal could be sort of financially managed, right? And uh, and I, I thought, oh, you know, where have you been all my life? I, I, I mean, I, I think I was born to write that plan, you know. So, um, so the plan is is actually quite extended and, and detailed. Um, and yet, it sort of I like like smack, I banged it all out in about three weeks because it was just all there. I was just excited about it. It's just it's really kind of fun. So, it's basically a complete picture of um, first, what I do first in the book is sort of lay out a thorough and sort of detailed and organized um, sort of outline of the sort of desiderata, you might say, that a finance plan ought to accomplish, right? What, what, what do we want of a Green New Deal finance plan, right? What should it do? Um, and that's a more complicated question maybe than some folk might initially think. And there's a tendency for people to think that that just basically means how do you pay for it? You know, where, where are we going to find some money for it? You know, but we know each other well enough to know that I'm not somebody who'd be asking, hey, where are we going to find money for this? That's just not the question. It never has been, never will be, right? Um, so it's really about, you know, when we talk about financing something big and ambitious like the Green New Deal, what are we actually talking about? We're not talking about raising money. So what are we talking about? And the way I picture it, the way I view this stuff, the way to think about finance uh, in connection with a big project like this is as a mode of organizing. It's a mode of mobilizing uh, and organizing and deploying and allocating resources in order to accomplish certain ends, right? Um, it's like a massive investment project. And as we all know, most of the brain, most of the, of the, of the brain work that goes into, um, you know, coming up with, um, you know, a 
a project plan of this kind is is less about where to find money than what to do with money. <laughs> right? so the, you know, could, yeah. could it be compared perhaps to uh, Keynes' um, How to Pay for the War document? <laughs> It kind of it can, except that it's much more broad, um, right? So um, it's it's definitely like Keynes is how to pay for the war in the sense that the primary focus, or one of the primary foci at least, is how to manage the money supply nationally in such a manner as to avoid uh, inflationary pressures building up in some sectors of the economy when there's a sudden uh, influx of expenditure in that sector as part of the plan, right? So in a way, one, one way to view the people's portfolio portion of that plan is as a kind of, it's a sort of a combination of the, the sort of Keynes, actually there's a, there's a sort of uh, Fed wallet component to the plan too. So you could say the, one way to think about how to pay for the war is it's a kind of pre-digital Fed wallet plan, right? Keynes is saying, okay, look, there's going to be inflationary pressure that might build at least if we don't limit domestic expenditure on consumer goods and the like when we're boosting public expenditure on war material and war mobilization and so forth. So what we should, and by the same token, when the war is over and we're winding down and demobilizing, there's going to be a sudden drain of purchasing power out of the economy. I mean, the public sector expenditures are suddenly going to dry up. And so there's going to be immense deflationary or depressionary pressure. So the way to act counter cyclically on this then is to sort of siphon off a lot of private sector money during the war itself to take the private component of upward price pressure out so that then the public component of price pressure can continue unabated without worrying about inflation. But save, basically, when you take that private component out, we don't just sort of burn it or throw it away. We put it in these sort of individual accounts for the citizenry, and those accounts kind of grow and build up over the course of the war. And then once we demobilize and the public expenditures diminish, we now say, hey, everybody, here, you know, now you have access to your wallets. Now you can spend. And so then you'd get a bunch of private sector uh, spending to kind of make up for the lost public sector spending. That, that's the sort of focus of the How to Pay for the War uh, pamphlet. And that is definitely part of what's going on with the Fed wallets in this connection, right? But the other thing that it's doing that's maybe more like Keynes's uh, Board of National Investment uh, proposed in the so-called Yellow Book or the Liberal Plan uh, in the 1920s, which he also popularized, by the way, in a, in a more pamphlet -y thing called uh, Can Lloyd George Do It? I don't know if you guys have ever seen that, that little piece. <laughs> It's a kind of how to pay for the war for the 1920s. Um, and it's a sort of a popularization of some of the more technical stuff that Keynes proposed in the Yellow Book. Uh, and it's just called Can Lloyd George Do It? Um, that the, the other component of this, um, or another important part of um, what this finance plan for the Green New Deal is, is is better analogized maybe to that BNI. And the idea is essentially to get serious about the public directing of allocation. Right. Uh, as we were talking about earlier, because if you think about it, I mean, that's sort of what part of what the Green New Deal would be, would be a massive public reallocation project. We're sort of saying, look, there are market failure reasons and other reasons, you know, like plain old political corruption reasons as well for a sort of excessive investment in fossil fuel industries, excessive investment in lots of other destructive sectors or subsectors of the economy. And part of what the Green New Deal about is about is sort of recalibrating or sort of re allocating, saying, look, let's phase out the fossil fuel stuff. And, you know, isn't it kind of embarrassing that, you know, we've had 20,000 years at least of some form of human civilization. And even after all those years, we still basically power ourselves by burning shit. You know, you have to like set something on fire basically in order to make anything happen. That's, that sort of sucks, right? It's, I mean, it's, it's sort of weirdly embarrassing. Like, we're not like, you know, walking around in hyena skins or something. So why the fuck are we like setting stuff on fire in order to make things happen, right? I mean, there must be better way. So, so, you know, basically the way to, you know, what we're talking about doing then partly then also with, with any sort of Green New Deal plan is like, Okay, let's do a big massive redirect, right? Let's get the stop this all that stuff from flowing to the burn shit sectors of the economy <laughs> and flow it in other ways, right? And and, and that's a, a kind of industrial policy, right? Um, so you could sort of think, you could say uh, allocation wise, it's industrial policy. 
modulation wise, it's sort of, you know, how to pay for the warism. It's sort of like Keynes's how to pay for the war plan. And you combine those two things together and that's sort of, and, 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 and directed in particular toward, you know, green friendly um, energy revitalist or green uh, sort of restructuring. And then it's basically a 21st century Keynesianism, you know, at least in, in that particular sense. And then by extension, sort of 21st century Vixellianism, uh, since I always tend to think of Keynes as basically, I, I tend to think in terms of lines of succession, right? And so I, you know, sort of pantheon like, as pantheon wise, I sort of think, um, you know, really cool stuff begins with Vixel. Then Keynes and Fisher are the British and the American uh, sort of carrying carriers on of some of the better aspects of Vixellianism, respectively. Uh, and then various followers of, of Keynes and Fisher end up being sort of the next in the lines of succession. The problem is with each sort of generation, there's, there's more dross as well. There are a whole lot of people who call the, the Keynesians who are just a disaster. And a lot of people who thought of themselves as followers of Fisher as well. And then the whole bloody school of Austrians, right? They're all basically Vixellians, but because of the Freudian stuff we talked about before, <laughs> they, they basically turned out to be a really bad, uh, uh, sort of a dead end, you know, kind of a, a bad detour. <laughs> I wish everybody who sort of, you know, throws like, you know, kind of waves this bloody shirt of a uh, yeah, dirty, yeah, this yeah. bloody flag of, you know, von Mises or Hayek or whatever. I wish every single one of them would just sort of replace it with either, you know, Vixel or, um, or uh, what's his name, uh, Myrdal, who's another one of the great followers of, of Vixel, or um, Olin, um, who was also a student of Keynes's, as you guys know. But um, imagine that. Imagine having studied under Vixel and then under Keynes. Um, Bertil Olin must have been, uh, he must have counted himself a one lucky oh. dude. <laughs> um, I think it's his great nephew is a, is a colleague of mine. Uh, his uh, great nephew, Jens Olin, is my colleague over at Cornell at the, at the law school. So, you know, anytime I walk by Jens's office, I kind of, you know, just. <laughs> I, th I think we, I think uh, um, Christian and I just feel lucky to have lived through a period where we, you know, we get to learn from the best economists in the world at the moment. We are in a great period, right? Because I mean, the fact that um, people like Stephanie and, and, and Warren uh, in particular, but also some of the others who were sort of in the, in the pantheon, like, like Pavlina, um, you know, and, and Fadl is, a, I mean, his, his, in, in his cohort, I mean, I think Fadl's going to be terrifically influential over time as well, especially also because he's quite explicitly, um, orientated um, beyond uh, the Anglosphere too, right? And beyond mm -hmm. beyond North America and even yeah. beyond the Anglosphere. Um, so I, I have a funny feeling that people, I don't know, 30 years from now will be talking, will be using Faudel's name or, or speaking it in the same sort of hushed tones in which we utter, you know, Warren's name or, or Randy's name or, or Stephanie's name now. Uh, so yeah, I think we are in a really, uh, we're in a wonderful time, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think we've ever been this close, right? To having almost a kind of, public consensus view emerging that's by and large consistent with this this proper take on on matters monetary well i think that's a great place to leave it this has been a total joy for me and i haven't even, I haven't even once had to look at my non-existent watch <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> honestly oh yeah. no thank you guys and, and truly anytime anytime you want to chat um about any of these topics or anything even collateral or related, I'm I'm always happy to do it. If we can don't tell it. us that because then we're gonna be like <laughs> calling you all the time. Happy to do it. Really <laughs> happy. A real joy to chat with you guys. That was the MMT podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget. You can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month, and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash mmtpodcast. You can also find me on Twitter at mmtpodcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino, and you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you. You know, we've had 20,000 years at least of America, of uh, <laughs> this terrible, that was a Freudian, I was about to say American. We've had 20,000 years at least of human civilization. We haven't even had one year of American <laughs> civilization, but at some point we'll get there.